Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our next installment of the Contemporary Writers Series. My name is Christopher Mason. I'm the director of choral activities here at Aquinas College. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. Last year, when I was or two years ago, I had the fortune of singing in a friend's master's recital at the University of Illinois, who is uh, of the Ojibwe culture, and she brought some of her music to that recital. I got to learn the music from her, and so was very delighted to meet with Shelley and learn about this series this year, um, and to bring a song to you to kick it all off. Uh, traditional music in the Ojibwe language is, uh, in ceremonial situations, is usually just a melody and a drum, uh, but what you'll hear today is an original composition that's based on an Ojibwe song that was gifted to a composer, and he used that tune as the inspiration for this piece. So you'll hear lots of harmonies, you'll hear singing that is evocative of that drum. It's a fusion of cultures, so to speak. Um, it is in the original language, and I wanted to tell you the translation and invite you to it. It is, Umbe, come in, two-legged beings, Come in, all people. There is good life here. Come in. Ani, everyone. Welcome, students and friends, uh, faculty and staff. We're so glad you came tonight. I'm Dr. Linda Keyway, and I am a faculty member here and member of the programming board for the Contemporary Writers Series. I'm also a member of the Little Travers Bay Band of Adawa. 
This is our 26. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> this is our 26th Contemporary Writers Series, and Dr. Troyer is our speaker tonight, and he's the second author that we've had this year. This year's theme has been on Native American authors. <clears throat> we would like to thank uh, Aquinas alumni, Dr. Tony Foster. I believe he's here somewhere. There he is. <laughs> Dr. Tony Foster and poet Linda, <clears throat> uh, Linda Nemec Foster for their generous contributions which have allowed us to invite outstanding nationally acclaimed authors such as Dr. Troyer. Um, I'd like to take just a minute and invite you to uh, silence your phones if you haven't done so already. Sometimes we forget, <clears throat> so that would be helpful. <clears throat> So we've invited um, an outstanding student, uh, Graham Stibe, a junior majoring in poli-sci and um, international studies. He's going to share with you the Marywood Dominican Sisters Land Acknowledgement Statement, and he will also introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Troyer. So Miigwech, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, and uh, like Dr. Keyway said, uh, first, before I introduce Dr. Anton Troyer, I'll first read the uh, Dominican Sisters Land Acknowledgement, and it reads as follows. It is fitting that we here at this assembly acknowledge this Aquinas campus and our Marywood campus as gifts of the Great Spirit's creation and the ancestral home of the Anishinaabe, the Odawa, the Ojibwe, and the Potawatomi tribal peoples of the Three Fires Confederacy. These indigenous tribes lived on, built a relationship with the earth as they cared for creation's gift. Land acres known on, now known as Michigan were stolen from indigenous peoples through misunderstood treaties, broken promises, and forced removal. We lament the violence caused by past actions of encampment and displacement. We apologize for these wrongs and prayerfully support and value Native American peoples and their ancestral homeland. We benefit and appreciate the sacred presence, beauty, and sounds of nature here. Dominican Sisters and Associates of Grand Rapids pray, study, minister, and form community on this holy ground. We strive to grow an awareness of our debt to Native peoples, past and present. So that was the land acknowledgement by the Dominican Sisters. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, tonight's distinguished guest, Dr. Anton Troyer. Dr. Tro Anton Troyer is an indigenous author, academic, and historian who specializes in Native history, specifically Ojibwe history, language, and culture. He was recognized in 2008 as a Guggenheim Scholar and has received awards from the, from the Distinguished American Philosophical Society, the National Endowments for the Humanities, among many other awards from many other different organizations. A simple Google search will show you just how prolific a scholar Dr. Troyer truly is. As alongside his duties as a professor at Bemidji State University, he's authored and edited many award-winning books. He is also the editor of Oshaka Bewis, the only academic journal published in the Ojibwe language. In the introduction of his popular book, Everything You Wanted to Know About Indians, Dr. Troyer calls himself an ambassador for his tribe and nation, as his nation is so commonly misunderstood and gone unseen. While at Princeton, he came to the realize that his passion was not to be found in the private sector, but to become an academic who could simultaneously work to maintain the integral cultural elements of Native Americans, and more specifically Ojibwe's, as well as acting in that ambassadorial role. Also within this introduction, he points out that 87% of schools in the United States do not require Native American history uh, after the 19th century. For instance, if it weren't for the class that Dr. Keyway taught last fall, I would not have known what Native American students went through in boarding schools well into the 20th century, um, as it was not emphasized in my public schooling. That is why it's important for us to read and listen to people like Dr. Anton Troyer who are putting in the effort to educate us and fill that missing gap of crucial knowledge of the culture and history of those around us. Now I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Anton Troyer. Miigwech. Koe maji taya ni wi ojibwem bangi de wind munugug. Hey pichi miigwech wendaman and enemigwan bajayan. 
Minua, we weni de mino, weji kiwendiang, den wazu and gay, mino nisodo ta de young. Wagush, indigu minua migizi and do dame, any wake wasawa di wish konigan wanger by on, gazaga squadji me cog, namanji do gish binisodo taguan o jibuemoyan. Gawin. English. They asked me to come and speak for an hour or so. They didn't say anything at all about using a foreign language like English. I'm really excited to be here tonight. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. And I'm so heartened by the efforts going on at Aquinas to elevate all kinds of voices and get us into conversation with one another. I firmly believe that every single one of us has something to teach and every single one of us has something to learn. And I am reminded by that, of that all the time as I have endeavored to raise my children and many other things. I am excited to share a little bit about the Cultural Toolbox, which is my most recent work. I know some of the students here have been uh, digging into everything you wanted to know about Indians, but were afraid to ask. And certainly we will have time to field some questions as we go on today as well. It was, uh, it was an interesting time for all of us being locked down with the pandemic. And for me, I, we have a very large family, nine kids. And uh, by the way, if any of you like children, let me know. <laughs> We're always looking for sitters. But I, at home with them, really had a chance to do a lot of reflection on a lot of different things that had been going on in my life. We also um, had a death in the family right at the start of the pandemic. And so I was thinking a lot about new life, about losses. And in this day and age, we're at a time when there are a little less than 7,000 languages spoken on planet Earth. And fewer than 100 of those languages are widely taught at colleges and universities. While many of us realize that we are at a time when there is a bottleneck and we are going to have a declension in the number of species of animals on planet Earth, many people are less well aware that we are also at a bottleneck and will be losing many bodies of knowledge and ways of knowing. And there's a lot at stake. It's not just another pretty bird sounding in the forest, which is what a lot of people think when they think about endangered languages. It would be nice to hear all the beautiful birds singing in the forest, but of what use are all those languages? And although I'm, it's really a different talk to share with you all of the reasons and all of the things happening in indigenous language revitalization, which is one of the fields that I spend a lot of my time in, I would just offer you this much. All of us have been deeply impacted by colonization. Colonization is taking one language, culture, and religion and using it to supplant all the others, often employing violence to achieve that end. But when you solve all your problems with violence, it makes a whole bunch of other problems. So why would we think that all of the problems created by the colonial way of solving problems could be solved by the colonial way of solving problems. And of course they can't. We have a lot to learn from one another. So as I started to work on this book, I was thinking about the pace of cultural change and a lot of my life's work in preserving and revitalizing Ojibwe language and culture. And I think a lot of times, especially for those of us from more marginalized communities, we sometimes start to think that we are less than if we didn't get everything handed on a silver platter. That there's a different kind of struggle to even know who we are. And so one of the things that I do like to share is that what's out there is not always just over the hill, but it's right here inside of us. And that you are a complete, fully realized human being. You are a soul who has a body, 
In our way, we will often say, we are not humans looking for a spiritual experience. We are spirits having a temporary human experience. And that you are the one your ancestors were praying for and waiting for through the generations. You have been given a unique set of gifts, and you yourself are a gift to the world. So I realize that I have had an maybe a less common but really remarkable opportunity to be immersed in my tribal language and culture. And I've thought very hard and worked very hard to try to transfer that to my children. And when we get to questions, feel free to ask more about my personal journey with some of this. But one of the things that I wanted to do was share you know, some way through my writing, some tools to help people understand how we, in my family, try to navigate the modern world with our cultural toolbox, our ways, our language, culture, and so forth. And so I'm going to share a couple of stories tonight, and I'll do a little bit of reading, and then field your questions. And hopefully that'll just Open a couple doors, and it'll be up to you to decide if you want to walk through those and do more. All right, story number one. And it's getting like this, y'all. Our ninth and final child was on her way in September 2011. My wife, Blair, was already dilating, and everything in her body said this would be a quick labor and relatively easy birth. I thought I was a professional at the dad role by now. I had an Ojibwe birthing go bag with everything I needed for baby's first bath and for bringing the placenta home to bury by a maple tree. I activated a phone tree we'd set up, so babysitters rushed to the house, and Blair's mom and sister converged on the hospital in minutes. I was managing everything like an experienced air traffic controller on Thanksgiving Day, and nothing went the way I expected. There were complications. Blair needed a cesarean section. Baby was breathing fine, but jaundiced, slow to cry or react to stimuli from the nurses, and seemed uninterested in nursing. Blair and I called one of my trusted mentors, Anna Gibbs. Anna was a remarkable woman, famously fierce, deeply knowledgeable, with a faith in our ways that never ceases to inspire me, even now, years after her passing. I relied on Anna's advice and friendship. She relied on my support and help. She sensed our stress and concern as we reported on the birth of Luella. There's Anna. Encouraging is not the word I'd use to describe Anna's response. She usually trampled everyone's emotions and just spoke her truth, and this time was no different. She sounded off the facts as she saw them. I'm filling my pipe right now, and I'm going to pray for her and the rest of you. Listen, you already know what to do. Use the Indian medicine for her first bath. Put out tobacco. Don't let those medical people do experiments on her afterbirth. That goes out in the woods. She will be okay. She will be more than okay. She will surprise you. I already had the dream for her Indian name. We did what we were told. Luella got her first bath in a warm tea made out of Nemewashk, catnip. We brought her placenta home and buried it on the north side of a maple tree, the tree of life, for her health and longevity. We furnished a feast and prayer on her fourth day on earth to welcome her arrival among us. I believed in everything we were doing, but I was still concerned about Luella. My other kids had taken to nursing right away, had started putting on weight, were active and gifted at crying at high volume. But Luella basically slept for weeks on end, nursing here and there. Anna was unperturbed. We had a little trouble coordinating all of my daughter's namesake schedules. So there was a delay, but six months after the birth, we gathered our extended family for her naming ceremony. Luella received several Ojibwe names that day, but Anna's was her first. Anna described in vivid detail the dream she had about a woman tall and strong, 
so filled with spiritual power that the eagles kept swooping, swarming, perching on her body, all along her arms, shoulders, neck, and head. Your daughter's name is Chiogima Benesikwe, Big Boss Eagle Woman. And then everything changed. Luella had basically slept for the first six months of her life. But after her naming, she didn't let anybody else sleep. She started to laugh loudly, cry loudly, nurse with gusto, and then crawl, walk, talk, scream, and boss everybody around like no kid I've ever seen. The cultural toolbox awakened something spiritually in her, and all my doubts were put to rest. Luella is fearless, confident, and strong, with a natural leadership persona that just can't be taught. Of all my kids, she is the one the world knows is utterly dauntless. Sometimes a picture says more. <laughs> and now. So with the writing, although this is a short little story to get it started, it's a way to provide a window into cultural practices rather than simply explaining, we have a medicine we use for the baby's first bath. The name of that medicine is Nemewashk. In English, it is catnip. We boil it, we turn it into a tea, you know. Instead of just describing, a story can help make it a little more relatable. It might be helpful for you to know, some of you may have a deeper awareness of this than others, but who are the Ojibwe? Ottawa, Potawatomi, many of us aren't quite well aware just how fast human languages and cultures change. In fact, anybody ever try to read Geoffrey Chaucer? Right? That was, he was one of the first people to try to write something down in English. And I can barely read that stuff, even though my English is really quite good. Right? And he was writing only 600 years ago. And that's a language widely spoken, widely taught, and has lots of publications, right? And so our languages shift quickly, and our cultures do too. Imagine a couple of common words in the English language that might have terrified somebody just 30 years ago, like motherboard and firewall. So the DNA of native people is ancient. In fact, I just read the Jennifer Raff book, Origins, and we have fields of inquiry that are speaking to each other that never did before. We thought for a long time only archaeologists would tell us anything about human origins and migration patterns, but now the linguists and the genomic mappers are telling us more and more. The DNA of Native Americans has been separated from other human DNA for 35,000 plus years. And while any book you might read that's 15 years old or older will say, 10,000 years ago, natives sprinted down to Clovis, New Mexico, killed a bison. We've got human tool cut marks on a bison bone to prove it. That now we have much more information pushing those dates back much further. So while the DNA of Ojibwe people is quite ancient, the emergence of the Ojibwe as a distinct group from other tribes within that language family is much more recent. In fact, the, the ancestors of the Ojibwe were on a migration from the Atlantic coast westward through the Great Lakes that had been ongoing really for a couple of thousand years. And as we separated from one another, our languages started to diverge. And our close cousins, Ojibwe, Ottawa, Potawatomi, which are very, very close, um, ended up diverging a little bit from one another and much more from some of our more distantly related cousins like Cheyenne, Blackfeet, and so forth. I wanted to put in a couple of disclaimers too. One of the things that happened on that migration is that as people moved into new areas, if somebody got too bossy or simply got too much influence, someone else was usually packing up their bags, moving down the river and saying, they're not my chief anymore. Both because of this, and 
I should also add a spiritual belief and practice that we should listen to the Creator, and we will get signs and ideas about what the Creator is saying through our dreams, visions when we're fasting, and so forth. So if I have a dream that I'm supposed to run a sweat lodge ceremony, the door's supposed to open to the east because the sun rises in the east. This symbolizes new life, and there are certain colors associated with each of the four directions. That's what I'd do. But if my neighbor had a dream that they were supposed to run a sweat lodge ceremony and the door's supposed to open to the south because the sun tracks from east to west across the south half of the sky, and that's a sign of healing and life, and that there are totally different colors associated with the four directions, well, that's what they do. As a result of this and our migration patterns in history, Ojibwe people tended to be quite tolerant of cultural variation within our ways. That's what they do over there. This is what we do here. But also completely intolerant of being told what to do. If you meet any of my cousins, you know exactly what I mean. And so as I share a little bit today, I'm sharing a little bit about my culture, what we do in my family. And I am in no way saying here's what all people from this kaleidoscope of Ojibwe cultures do. It's not a Bible for the ways or something like that. This is something that I really appreciate, too, about our ways, is that there isn't an institution like a church that says, here's your script. And you say it like this, this many times, you know. And so that provides a lot of empowerment to the people, but also can be quite confusing for outsiders who are trying to figure out what do they do. Right? So that's worth saying. Also, you know, I, I organized this kind of in four main sections correlated with the four seasons. Spring, summer, fall, winter correlate to four seasons in a person's life. Babies, young people, adults, elders. Uh, as a way to give a sense for not just the seasonal harvest culture, but different chapters in a person's life and what's in the cultural toolbox, so to speak, around that. I also should mention just a word or two about boundaries because um, unlike evangelical religions and things like that, which are supposed to be shared with everybody on planet Earth, some things in Ojibwe culture are actually secret. And they, we don't want to tell people, walk around your elders and go get your information from a book. We want to tell people, walk to your elders and go through your ceremonies and get your information in its cultural context. And so as a result, some things we can share openly and widely, like the story of my daughter's birth, and some things are a little bit more guarded and shared, for example, as part of someone's initiation into a sacred society or things like that. So I had to navigate this because I'm also, among the hats I wear, is I'm somebody who lives in my home community, and I officiate at naming ceremonies, traditional funerals, and lots of things in between. And so I have to respect our protocols for cultural gatekeeping at the same time that I'm very interested in helping our culture, you know, thrive. So that was a tension I was navigating through the work. And so I will share a few more stories. By the way, all the pictures you'll see will be some of my kids. Here's Evan. Uh, and one of the things to share, too, is that, you know, in that spirit, as we look for information about any culture, about our own cultures, whatever those might happen to be, that it's not just something that's out there and over the next hill, but as I mentioned, it's something that's inside of us. So, connection and culture live inside of us, and having a rich cultural life is not just about looking out and looking for, it is about looking within. And we can do that wherever we live, and the awakening is healing and empowering. So I will, I, I guess I should also mention, you know, you, you got a little story on the birth of Luella, and then I would share more about the culture of spring and new life and that kind of chapter in, in our 
culture and in a person's life. This is my son Isaac, and this picture is a few years old, so he's 21 now. And I used his story to kind of introduce the season of summer. I really believe that in former times, he would simply have been the most promising young warrior in the village. But in this day and age, and in the environments that we have to send our children to, it was a whole different story. That kid could sit still in a deer stand for five hours in a row, unflinching, waiting for some animal to come out of the woods, but he could not sit still in a desk for five minutes to save his life. He was fierce and hilarious, even at the earliest age. I remember one time he was two years old, just two, and he had a one-year-old brother, and he came up behind him and gave him a good push, right? Sent the kid sprawling, and he goes, I take time out? I was like, yes, you will, baby, time out. Then thinking, like, that did any good, you know? And he was impervious to discipline and so tough. I saved all of his discipline reports from the early childhood program because there were some really, really great ones in there. <laughs> when he gets married, I'm reading as many of these as I can because they're so good. So one said literally, like, today your son said some derivation of the word but 300 times. But, buttocks, butt crack, help, you know. I was like, ooh, save pile, you know. And uh, another time, one said, today your son said a foul word in the early childhood program. We told him, you can't do that. Now we have to tell your father, to which he replied, you better not. I'll kick your ass. I'm a Power Ranger. <laughs> Sorry, sisters. And uh, in any event, like, he, it was like this. I remember one time he was like 12, and uh, he was punking his siblings with the kind of psychological torture where he would like needle them and whisper things at them until they would break and do something outrageous, and then they would be in trouble, right? You know the kind. And so uh, I could see it happening, and I said, all right, you are old enough to spend a little time at home alone. If you don't knock it off, you've earned a day alone while the rest of us go to drum ceremony. Sure enough, one more time. I was like, that's it. You're staying here. Everybody else, here we go. Drove off, went to drum ceremony, and about an hour or so later, boom, the door bursts open to the dance hall, and he comes strutting in there with a big grin on his face. I'm like, how did you get here? Did you hitchhike? Nope. I ran. <laughs> 11 miles. So then am I supposed to be like mad or proud? <laughs> right? So he was like that. Flash forward to high school. We're getting the letters, and you've probably seen these, any of you who've, who've uh, parented in high school. Actually, you know, even anyone who survived high school and made it this far, congratulations. But they'd be sending the letters home. Test day's coming up. Make sure your kid is well-rested, you know, well-fed, on time. And so we got him there, and he took one look at his test and went like this. Tsh, 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 tsh. Woo, I'm finished, finished, are you finished? Let's go. And the teacher's like, to the principal's office, let's go. IEP, individual education plan, let's see if you need some meds. All right, so we're there for the IEP. And they had a toolbox. And you've all probably seen it, right? Like, you have a very strong-spirited young man here. I'm like, oh, crap, what did he do now? <laughs> we want to catch him being good, so every time he's good, there's a gold sticker. And if he gets enough gold stickers, then he can get a treat out of the treat jar. And here's a permission slip. Can we give your kid gum? And he can sit on a ball. He doesn't have to sit on a chair. And, you know, yeah. So I was looking at all of that, and I said, you know, I love you, and I feel your pain. This is not going to work. This kid is unmotivated by rewards and punishments. He's motivated by something else. So to give you a hint, here's a little bit about something else. We have a custom. When somebody enters the ranks of a successful hunter, the first time they make a successful kill of an animal, and the ancient custom used to be if somebody got a deer, they'd cook up the whole deer and invite over the whole wigwam village and they'd eat it in one fell swoop. 
today we live like everybody else, so we're kind of going to school and work and scattered and whatnot. So we will cook up some of the deer and invite over aunts, uncles, grandparents, namesakes, extended family, and we'll have a feast. And there's a prayer. And then instead of just eating, we ritually feed the successful hunter. So we will take a spoon of the food and we'll say his name. So in this kid's name is Beja Gobanes, Lone Thunderbird. Beja Gobanes. And he has to refuse the first bite and say, no. I'm thinking about children who don't have enough. Huh. Okay, so put it back. Take another spoonful. Beja Gobanes. And he refuses again. No. I'm thinking about my elders who can't get out in the woods to hunt for themselves. Hmm. Okay. And again, Beja Gobanes. No. I'm thinking about my family, my community, people who came here today to support me. Huh. Okay. And then again, Beja Gobanes. And then he can eat. And then we'll say, Beja Gobanes, you just changed your life. Up until today, you were what we called a dependent. You depended on all the people in this room to provide all your food. And there they are, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles. Today, though, you are providing for all of us. And that's what it means to be an adult. From today on, you'll have a special power. And it's the power to gather resources. You'll have it when you go hunting, fishing, pick wild rice or berries. You'll have it when you get a job. So when you use your power, think about children who don't have enough. Your elders who can't get it for themselves. Your family, your community. And then they take the rest of their kill, packaged up venison, and they give it away so they're impoverished. But rich. We'll add other teachings. Both boys and girls go through this ceremony. And we'll add other teachings, and they include things like, you might notice there are different kinds of deer in the woods. Fawns, does, immature bucks with just a couple of horns, and big mature antlered bucks, and they all act differently from one another. Deer are gentle creatures. They don't really attack people very often, but on the rare occasions when they do, the deer most likely to charge a person is not a big, mature, antlered buck. It's actually an immature buck. And they're also the deer most likely to be shot or hit by a car. And in a way, what that is, is it's a metaphor for manhood. We make a lot of our biggest mistakes when we're young. That's when we're the most likely to think driving 90 miles an hour was a good idea or experiment with drugs and alcohol and pay a heavy price, or not respect somebody when we're on a date. If you want to live to be a big, mature, antlered buck, you got to act like one. They move a little slower. They're a little more cautious. And so I think it's a really powerful entry point in someone's life to give those messages. We have lots of ceremonies, and there are many other things kind of beyond what I'll be able to do tonight, even as girls come of age, get their first menstrual period, there are, there's a year of ceremonies that are full of empowerment teachings, including things like, these are usually orchestrated by the aunts and grandmas and, you know, female namesakes, and they will include things like this. You have a right and also a responsibility to be respected by men. Here's what that means. No one can hit you. No one can call you names. No one can make you do something sexually that you do not want to do. What a different world we'd have if we did things like this for all of our young girls as they transitioned into adulthood with their brothers watching. So I love this stuff, and it has had such a powerful effect on our kids. So back to Isaac. Just to give you an idea of how he internalized this, he'd get a rabbit hunting, and he would call up my mom and say, Noko, noko, and wabus. And she'd say, Ooh, no, jeshe, I'm cooking for you tonight. And I was like, Check it out. There's an intergenerational transmission of generosity, caring, and sharing 
and I didn't have to say, go over there and get your grandma a rabbit. Same kid. One time I had a friend who was complaining. He said, oh, man, my back. I haven't been out in the woods. I haven't been hunting in so long. I don't even have any deer meat in my freezer. So he was about 16 then. He didn't say anything, but he went out in the woods. He harvested a deer, and he cleaned it up, packaged it up, went over to my friend's house, filled up his freezer, and he left. And my friend called on the phone, and he said, I, I didn't even know people remembered that teaching. What an amazing young man. I, I have some gifts I want to give him, you know. And again, I didn't have to say, go fill up that guy's freezer. He just did that. Same kid, senior year in high school. He and a buddy were going to double date to the prom. And uh, we went and ordered a tux for my son. And then my son's friend, his mother didn't have that much money. And so she said, my next check, I'll get you the tux, I promise. And then her car broke down. And then she said, I'm so sorry, but I can't. I, I don't have it. So he was all heartbroken, ready to cancel his prom date. My son said, forget that. Come with me. They went to the tux place. They canceled his tux rental. They took the money. They went to the Goodwill. They bought a couple of suits, and everybody went to prom. And I remember learning about this thing. Son, if you, could, if you just told me, I would have rented the kid a tux. He said, but it's my responsibility to look out for people who don't have enough. How cool is that? You know? So I had to tell the teachers at school, like, your toolbox is based on rewards and punishments. Right? Like, punish bad behavior, reward good behavior. It's focused on individuals. Individualism. Competition. Competing for more stickers and stuff like that. He's unmotivated by those things. But he's highly motivated by relationships. You should see what he does. I said, if you want to motivate him, we need to speak to him in his cultural language, which they tried to do. And to their credit. And so sometimes we had to send him down to the earlier grades to tell stories. He was doing great at that. But we got him through school unmedicated, full of swagger, and he is a fine, load-bearing citizen today. But how often do we force the kids to speak someone else's cultural language and crush those inclinations and marginalize or devalue those kind of cultural ways of approaching things? So, we got time for maybe one or two more. There's Isaac again and again. Here's another kid. So, Isaac's kind of a, a, the beginning of a window into summer. Ceremonies for young people, you know, transitioning into adulthood and things like that. And this is another one of my sons. His name's Elias. Bogwajanini. And for him, I use his story as a window into fall, which is our season, you know, that's more related to adulthood, and really using my relationship with him as a window into my, you know, transitions into parenting and parenting adult children and things like that. And so, uh, I have to give you a little bit of background to, to understand the story. So we have nine children. It's a big, beautiful, blended family. His, theirs, and somebody else's kids. And so I was married previously. And my ex-wife had a terrible stumble into the darkness. The kind of darkness that actually affects everybody in this country one way or another. She got into drugs. Um, against all odds, she is still alive. But I live in a big, beautiful house full of 
children and life and things like that. And we have tried everything to help pull her out of the darkness. She is literally homeless. We can't pull her out of it. She's still actively using. This kid was an infant in arms when she fell. So, in many ways, he is the recipient of the kind of blessings and curses only a father can bestow. With no memory of being held by his mom, job number one for a parent is do not mess your kids up. But you only get one shot at it and you don't get any do-overs. It's a terrifying job. So we had to restart right at the start. And I remember there, too, relying on the cultural toolbox. We had a house blessing ceremony, and for us, we blessed a little eagle feather, hung it on the southwest corner of the house. It was like a protection whenever it was storming and things like that. I remember sharing that with him, and sometimes when it started storming, he'd run outside, do a lap around the house, double check on the eagle feather, and come back in soaking wet. You know, but it seemed to reassure him. He was quite happy doing that. <laughs> And then uh, we had another one where we built a little miniature wigwam. We call this a bear smoke, and we put offerings in there for each member of our family, kind of keeping us close under the same lodge. And there, too, he'd be running around playing in the woods, and he'd stop, and he'd look at it, and then he'd smile and run off playing. And so as things went on, I remember watching them. I might be a little anxiety-prone, and so uh, I'd take them out to eat, usually at a buffet where we could get instant gratification because there were a lot of them and they're really quite a handful. And I'd say, put us in the far back, as far away from regular humans as possible. And they would, like, the kids would go to the front to go to the bathroom and run through the restaurant yelling, I took a crap! I took a crap! You know, and I was like, no! I don't know them! I'm just babysitting! I don't know! One time we are at the buffet and he was trying to get his hands through the sleeves of his coat and he couldn't get them through, and I said, oh, okay, baby, what's in your hands? Oh, oh, I got the mac and cheese. <laughs> and he's like trying to smuggle two cents worth the mac out of the buffet, which on the one hand is like crazy cute kid antics, and then me being a little anxiety prone, I'm like, oh, no. Is he going to have like food issues now? You know, like his mom can be taken, so anything can be taken. So now he's going to be hoarding candy bars between the mattresses or what, you know. So I was getting all worried. <clears throat> but he seemed to do just fine. He really, really got into music. He's a great singer. And uh, at his high school, they had a show choir, kind of the equivalent of Glee Club, in preparation for which I had to watch every episode of every season of Glee with the kids which is a bit of a lift, but uh, I was teasing him, and I was saying, you know, it's going to be just like that show. Whoever's dating somebody at the start of the year, they're going to be switching, and they'll all be dating different people at the end of the year. And I said, there's going to be a lot of crying, it's going to be a lot of hugging, and there'll be a big fat trophy at the end of the year. Shut up, Dad. You don't know what you're talking about. It won't be like that. And so uh, I had to miss his first out-of-town meet. I said, call me, doesn't matter, midnight, one in the morning, whatever it is. And so he called. And I get the call, which is really, I wish I had this recorded because it was one of my favorite kid conversations to get from a teenage boy. And it started with, Dad, I love you. I was like, I love you too. How's it going? And uh, I got like a dozen spontaneous I love yous out of my teenage son. He's like, Dad, we won. We won. Everybody's crying. They're all hugging each other. It's like, I told you. And he found a way to, like, sing through the adversity, you know? And then, of course, the pandemic hit, and show choirs canceled, and proms canceled, and your social life's canceled, and man, he was having a hard time. And by the way, for all kids, it is a requirement that they break from their parents so they can have their own independent thoughts, and it's a healthy thing to happen. It seemed for us, that the girls would go through this a little bit earlier than the boys, and they'd usually have a good fight with my wife around that time. And the boys, it would happen later, and it would seem very clunky because it would happen at like age 17 
which is also when you're supposed to develop launch plans and come up with whatever happens next. Right when they're like, you don't have anything you could teach me and I'm not interested in your coaching, right? And so uh, I had to push him and I said, you know, son, I know this has been a really hard time, but whether you like it or not, something's coming next. There are a thousand definitions of success. You don't have to come up with any one that I might come up with. You just need to come up with one. My job is to support you. If you're interested in any coaching, I'm happy to do that, but it's not a requirement. What are you going to do? And he said, well, I want to get out of this town. And I was like, hey, that's a good idea. He said, I want to go to college. I said, I like the sound of that. So I was thinking maybe like Dartmouth. Of all the Ivy League schools, that's the one that actually has some native programs. And that's my plan. I said, well, that's a wonderful plan. And I'm a little embarrassed to admit this because I like literally published 20 books. But uh, I may have looked down my nose a little bit at the true power of like journaling and writing about your own story and rewriting your story and, you know, doing the Brene Brown thing and all that. But I, uh, I totally have a different view now. So he had to do some writing. And he was quite close um, with my dad. My dad, by the way, and this is a side note, but feel free to ask questions about it when we get there. My father was an Austrian Jewish immigrant and a Holocaust survivor. He wasn't native at all. And he and two cousins and both of his parents survived. Everybody else was killed in the Holocaust. My son was quite close with my dad. Um, and just looking at all the things that our family had gone through, my grandmother had gone to residential boarding school on my mom's side uh, and had a really rough experience there. My mother had to struggle through like pretty visceral poverty and things like that. And so he... He identified these stories and mentioned them, but really focused his essay on his mom and times when he was hurt and times when he was sad and times when he couldn't feel anything at all and then felt guilty for not being able to feel anything at all. And then he said some of the most profound stuff I've ever heard. And he said, we are more than the sum of our tragedies. And all this trauma stops with me. Out of a teenage boy. There had been times when people told me things like, you saved those kids, you pulled them out of the darkness, just think what would have happened if you didn't do that. And it never quite resonated for me. We were getting through the days but when I think about that kid running around to check on the feather on the corner of the house, looking at the bear smoke in the woods, finding a way to sing through all of it, he was restoring my faith in our cultural toolbox, my faith in the decency of humans, in our resiliency, in our ability to persevere. I didn't save that kid. He saved me. All right. Do I have time for one more and then a couple questions, or do I need to knock it off? One more. All right. I'll read you one. Is that all right? <laughs> okay. I'll read you one. So, you know, the, uh, that was a little bit on fall, and I'll give you one last one on winter. And so this is a story about my my mother. And then after that, I'll be happy to field some questions, and, uh, and then we can wrap things up. So my mother, Margaret Peggy Troyer, used to call following our ways walking the red road. And walking that road my entire life has always led me to look for signs. And here there's a reference to this guy named Archie Mose. So when, when I had finished college at Princeton University, I probably terrified my own parents, saying I'm not taking a job, I'm not going to graduate school, I'm coming home to walk the earth, hang out with my elders, and they're like, good luck paying for that, because we're done. And, uh, but I did, and I ended up living with this spiritual leader who 
you know, was pretty much a monolingual Ojibwe speaker. And I had a kind of immersive experience in our language and culture, just driving him around to all the places he wanted to go. And it was really quite transformative for me and set me on the path for, you know, some of the language and culture work that I do now. And it was interesting when I went to see him. He didn't know who I was. I knew him because he was famous. But, uh, you know, he, he, I thought he'd be like sitting in a wigwam praying for world peace or something, and he was watching WWF Smackdown on a TV <laughs> and laughing really loud. And so uh, I was like, oh, this isn't what I was thinking would be happening here. And he sh dead shut off the TV, though, and he said, oh, I've been waiting for you. And the reason he said that is he had a dream about someone, and I looked like this person from his dream, and that was enough for him to, like, open the door, have me live on his couch, and be his gopher, to go for this, go for that, drive me here, drive me there. Yeah. So that's referenced briefly here. The dream that Archie Mose had about me changed both of our lives and led me to commit my life's work to helping others find the red road. The vision I had when I went fasting as a young man deepened and amplified my sense of purpose in this world. Signs can help us find our way. For me, a great revelation came when I was touched by winter's hand. The signs that help us find our way are not always dreams and visions and signs from nature. They can be people. The people who have been my signposts and guides have often been elders whose winter wisdom illuminated the path. Archie had a dream about me that inspired his faith in me, and that inspired my faith in myself. But it was my relationship with him and my showing up to live the culture with him that really changed my course. How ironic, then, as venerated as Ojibwe elders are and as strongly as I relied on mine, that my deepest understanding of elderhood was sparked by one of the youngest humans in my life, my daughter, Mia Troyer. <clears throat> Mia is 12 years old now. She has bright brown eyes and olive skin. She is so sweet and kind and accommodating that people are sometimes taken by surprise to see how incredibly confident, self-assured, and assertive she can be when she feels the need. She doesn't occupy a lot of airspace. She just acts, like when she mastered all of the curriculum for third grade by the end of the first month of school and had to get bumped up a grade. She seems to have control of her life. It would be completely intimidating if she weren't so humble to the point of shyness about her remarkable brain and spiritual insight. When I was Mia's age, I never felt in control of anything in my life. I have fond memories of those years. I grew up in the little cabin that I escaped to after the failure of my marriage to Elias's mother. It had kerosene lanterns and an outhouse in those days. But we spent our summers picking pin cherries, plums, and blueberries, and raspberries. We washed up at the river or area lakes, which meant swimming every day. <clears throat> my mother was my red road in those days, showing us how to tap maple trees and snare rabbits, and dragging us to many different kinds of ceremonies. It must have been hard for my mom at times, but as a 12-year-old boy, I had all I ever wanted. My brother David and I built forts and dug trenches across the dirt road in front of our house to mess with the cars whizzing by, sometimes to dramatic effect. My mother went through big transitions in those years. She had recently become the first female native attorney in the state of Minnesota. It was so inspiring to me to see her step into the courtroom with her Indian Health Service Coke bottle eyeglasses, powwow braids, and sorrel boots to stand up to the people and in institutions of white power. I destroyed it. <laughs> she launched a remarkable career, but for the rest of my childhood, <clears throat> she had a lot less time for berry picking. I remember her building clients for her private law practice. By the way, don't worry about it, Mark. I'm pretty much at the end of the slideshow anyways. Yep. Um, she took payment in walleye and wild rice from a lot of her native clients. Eventually, the financial reward started to grow, and she built a big, beautiful home for her family just on the other side of a five-acre pond from the cabin we had called home for years. Her relationship with my dad had a traumatic test at that time, too. 
They kept the details from their kids, as parents often do. But my mom moved out for three months. After she came back, she seemed emotionally distant from all of us for years. They divorced several years later when the last of my siblings was finishing high school, but the emotional separation happened when I was still in middle school. As a kid, I found my father's transgressions and my mother's reaction both baffling and painful. Although boys often pull away from their mothers as a natural part of maturing and finding independence when they become teenagers, it felt like more than that to me. She was emotionally distant when I wanted her close. As a preteen and teenager, I had to learn how to rely on other parts of our cultural village to nourish my needs. I poured myself into school, friends, hunting, and fishing. It was hard for me to find the same depth of connection with my mom, who retreated to her work, books, and television. I was busy too, finishing high school, college, and graduate school, spending countless hours at ceremonies, and traveling all over Ojibwe country, then starting a family, restarting, and raising children. There were signs along the way pointing me back to my mom. Her battle with lung cancer was one. I was at her house with my pipe, outside the surgery door with tobacco, by her side for ceremonies afterwards, and she beat it cancer-free for over a decade. That experience echoed a decade later when she got pancreatic cancer. More ceremonies, more food offerings, and more luck. She beat that too and never got cancer again. But nothing was the same. She needed oxygen day and night. She was still in the world and able to laugh and watch her grandchildren, but she was frail now. She tired easily. My mother had been my cultural anchor Red Road coach, and recreational companion for the first 12 years of my life. Neither one of us knew it would be this way at the time, but she never reclaimed those roles in my life. The reasons were understandable, but it was still painful. I missed her. My mother's declining health left me feeling powerless. In many ways, that's exactly what we all are when it comes to facing the mortality of our loved ones. Any power I felt before that was just imagined. I own my share of the distance between my mother and me. I was so busy trying to provide for my kids and revitalize our language that it was hard for anyone to keep up with me. My mother never lacked ambition, but she wasn't born in a hurry-up time. I've come to realize, too, that I was mad at her. I was a little resentful that she never reasserted herself at the center of my childhood the way that she had when I was little, but I was really upset that she smoked cigarettes. Right through two cancer battles and even with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. The spirits had given her new leases on life, but she was shortening her time and further reducing her ability to be physically and mentally present with her family because of her limited lung function. I routinely picked up my mom's medications and brought her to appointments. She needed me and my sister Megan now and relied upon us for this help. We started to serve as intermediaries with her doctors since she was often tired and forgot important details. When they told us that there was only an 18% chance that she would be alive three years later, it finally felt real. After getting her settled at her house, I warmed up my car and drove down the road a mile or so pulled over and cried. I would lose her. There was no way around that. But losing the closeness between us that had sustained me throughout my childhood seemed like a needless sacrifice. I just couldn't see a way to overcome her fatigue, much less all the time that had passed, to make things like they were. The kids were LARPing, live action role playing, when I got home, fighting epic battles with foam weapons in the snow outside the house. I changed into my snow bibs and smacked them around with LARP weapons for a few minutes before making everyone load up to haul sap in the sugar bush. My truck pulls a 300 gallon water drum and we filled it up. When we got home after all the playing and chores, the kids were exhausted. They all went inside to snack and rest. Mia was the sole exception. She was staring at me next to the truck, her bright brown eyes seeing more than they should have been able to. What's wrong, Dad? Uh, everything's okay. I'm just worried about Grandma Peggy. She kept staring and asked, Can you take me to see her? I nodded. 
Just a minute, she said, and scurried into the garage and came back with a pouch of tobacco I had left on the workbench and an ax. For Grandma, she said, as she opened the tobacco and put a pinch in my hand. By the way, you might, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but we use tobacco as kind of a reciprocal offering. So instead of just making a prayer, it's kind of a, something that's done to say we're not taking, but we are exchanging our request for this offering. Um, so uh, she said, opening the tobacco, put a pinch in my hand. We put the tobacco by a pine tree, said a short prayer, and drove to her house. I couldn't help but wonder whether that kid brought the axe for the firewood we'd be splitting, or if it was a reminder of what it meant in our cultural toolbox. So the axe is a metaphor in the Ojibwe world. They say, Like if there's ever a bramble in your life, you know, pick up your hatchet or pick up your axe, and it's a way of saying, if things ever get hard, pick up your ways. After that, Mia was in my ear often asking to go see her grandma. She wanted to bake cookies at her house. She wanted to watch football with her. She wanted to watch movies. My mom knew how to play her grandkids. And so she kept popsicles, candy, and cookies in ample quantities. She had a fully loaded entertainment system and big fluffy pillows to lounge on while watching television. Mia knew that Grandma's house was, was too small and couldn't handle all of us at the same time, so she timed her requests perfectly to force me to take her. And she was always easier company at my mom's because she wasn't trying to start a LARP war in the house, which her brothers simply could not stop doing. But part of me wonders whether that little 12-year-old kid was orchestrating all that time at Grandma Peggy's for herself, her grandmother, or for me. The spirits have a lot of ways to get things done. My mom did get tired easily, but she was still a fireball. Mia liked it when she talked about politics because my mother could not talk about Donald Trump without cursing. The cursing made me want to go cover Mia's ears because my mother was gifted at the art as only a res girl straight out of Bina can be. But Mia just giggled at her political tirades and my discomfort with the cursing. As I was prepping food for my mother and daughter, doing the dishes, watching television shows, and talking politics, my mother started to share stories with me that I had never heard. There were stories about her childhood, her marriage to my dad, another boyfriend before him who wanted to get married. She asked me to help her with paperwork, deeds, retirement accounts, her will, and funeral instructions. She forbade me to officiate any part of her send-off, even though I had been officiating at funerals for years. You can help other families when their loved ones change worlds. When I go, you have to focus on your own grief and the needs of your family. She didn't leave much to chance. The long hours together seemed to thaw the ice between us. My mother and I had a lot more heart-to-heart -heart talks. I told her everything I had been feeling, and the pain seemed to evaporate when we shined some light on it. She explained that she didn't have a lot of examples of what healthy relationships, healthy parenting, or even healthy communication looked like, but she was so glad we were talking now. I came to realize that I didn't need my mom to be what she had been when I was 12, architect of my life and constant companion. I just needed to know that I was loved that deeply all along, and I was. A warm, peaceful understanding flowed between us. I feel it still. My mom proved the doctors wrong one last time. We held that state longer than the three years they thought she'd have, but not forever. We moved her to Megan's house when her time got short. Mia and her siblings came with me often. We sang her Ojibwe songs and fed her the last food she'd be able to take, chocolate pudding. She woke up once after that to ask for her bundle of sacred items and held them close in her soft, leathery hands until she pulled her last breath. My brother Micah shut off her oxygen machine. Peace. As I reflect on those last few years of my mother's life, I'm not sure who was helping who. At the time, I thought I was being a good, dutiful son helping his mom in her old age, but I was being schooled by my 12-year-old daughter in the importance of forgiveness, communication, and the power of just showing up. And through all the paperwork, conversations, chores, and tobacco offerings, my mom taught me how to navigate the winter, our season of aging, 
and dying, peace and wisdom. What a gift they have given. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I realize that I may have pushed the clock a little bit. Do we have time for a couple questions? All right, so we have time for a couple questions. There are mics up here, so you can come on up and, uh, and shout them out, and I'll be happy to, to uh, answer as many as we have time for. Yes. Hello. Over the years, my husband attended many powwows, and he brought home for me lovely beaded items, many things that I have, but I hesitate to wear because they might be mere baubles, and to the people who made them, they may have spiritual meaning. So what, what should I do? I also want to ask you about what you're wearing and what it might mean to you. Ah, yes. So first of all, you know, the, the question that really comes up, thank you for a great question, is really about cultural appropriation. Where do we draw the lines? What's okay? What's not? And so uh, there's my mom as an elder. And so uh, I would say this. First of all, if your experience or item or what have you, if, if, if this is native-led, you're okay as a general rule of thumb. If somebody's saying, hey, come to our powwow, go to the powwow. If somebody's saying, hey, eat this food we cooked, go ahead, eat the food they cooked. If someone says, buy my art, go ahead and buy their art, and you can display it proudly. Um, if you are... On the other side of it, you know, doing something native-inspired but not native-led, that can be on thinner ice. Uh, you know, the Boy Scouts doing the Order of the Arrow initiation, dressed up in faux native regalia, you know, saying that they are giving someone a native ceremony or experience through that, right? In between, there are gray areas. Sometimes it's hard to know exactly where to draw the lines. But I would say that the art, the moccasins, the whatever, you know, that somebody produced and wanted somebody to acquire from them, you know, that's fine. You know, stuff looted from a grave, you know, totally different, right? So, uh, so I, I, the stuff you describe, I would say, go for it. You know, put the art on the wall, wear the moccasins, that'll be fine. Uh, you know, and sometimes in between there are a variety of other issues, and so when in doubt, Ask some Native people, where would you draw the line? Not that we will all give you the same answer, you know, which I realize can be confusing, but you will have some feedback. And if someone says, I really think you should handle it like this, you can also follow it up with, are you okay if I bring you into the conversation? If somebody gives me a hard time, you know, depending on the circumstances of things. But, you know, we have to learn and find our way through that. Yeah, great question. Oh, yes, and this. So it may be a little hard to see, but you're welcome to check it out when I'm out there signing books. So that's a northern flicker. It's a small bird in the woodpecker family. And uh, I had a dream about one, and so this was kind of like, you know, guardian angel or something like that. I have, by the way, a whole collection of native bling. Uh, that include this. I've got another one for my native name, Wagush, which means fox. I've got another one for my clan, which is the Eagle Clan. And I've got other ones, too, that range from, you know, varying degrees of spiritual importance or meaning, you know. So it's, yeah, it's partially decoration, but this one actually has a little story behind it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, go right ahead. Yeah, I'm interested in your Jewish roots and what you uh, learned from Jewish spirituality, and I'm curious to know how your parents met. Ah, so, oh man, that's a whole nother book. <laughs> I would say this, first of all, my father, uh, their family was largely secular, even though 100% Jewish. Uh, when they came to America, my dad did do Hanukkah and Passover, um, but he wasn't, you know, going to synagogue on a 
regular basis or something like that. Um, we, in remembrance of my father, still spark up the menorah every winter and, and so forth. And let's see, there, there's so much to share about my dad's story. Like he lived a very long life and we, I was very close with him. Uh, I was with him on his first trip back to Austria after World War II. And I just took my family back there this summer. Uh, and there's a lot I could share about that particular experience too, which is very different for me on those different trips. Uh, my parents met, my father had kind of restarted his life many times. So he, you know, was about 14 when he made it to America. He was at 17, lied about his age, signed up for the U.S. Army so he could go kill Nazis at the end of World War II, but they sent him to the Pacific Theater and he was stationed in the Philippines. Whoops. And, uh, you know, he was a labor union organizer. He was a high school English teacher. And then he took a job working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and met my mom who had just finished her nursing degree and came back to work for our tribe's health program. She went for her law degree after they were married. Yeah. So, happy to say more, but uh, any other questions? Okay. With that, thank you so much for being here. Miigwech. Thank you. Miigwech.